Good morning, and welcome to the First Baptist Church of Rest Sunday Morning Bible Study. We are beginning a new series today, and uh, our Bible studies uh, are presented and written on a quarterly basis, so this begins what we call our winter quarter, and we'll be in the book of Luke, the New Testament uh, book of Luke. So uh, I'm looking forward to this. We were in uh, Isaiah, which was a good study, had 13 weeks of that, and now we'll be in, in the book of Luke. So I encourage you to get a Bible uh, uh, and turn to chapter 1. We'll read some verses there together uh, in just a moment and comment on them, and I hope that they'll be a blessing to you. Let's pray together first. Father, I do thank you for this uh, privilege of presenting this Bible study. I thank you, first of all, for your word that you've given to us through Scripture, through the Bible, through the Holy Scriptures. And uh, I thank you that we are free to, to read, study, m contemplate, discuss, uh, present, uh, and, and that this is a, a wonderful privilege that we have that not, is not enjoyed by everyone. So I, I thank you for that. I pray that those who hear this Bible study will uh, be uh, helped and that you'll speak to us all and challenge us uh, about uh, your work and your will and your purposes in each of our lives and in the world today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, the focal verses that we'll focus on begin at verse 13 in chapter 1, but, uh, but uh, we need to uh, uh, at least introduce this chapter by pointing out that uh, they tell of uh, this man uh, called Zechariah, who was the husband of Elizabeth, who were the parents of John the Baptist, the person that would become known as John the Baptist, the forerunner uh, and uh, proclaimer of the coming Messiah, Jesus, uh, related to Jesus by, uh, by uh, the uh, relationship between Mary and, uh, and Elizabeth. But, um, Zechariah was a priest there in serving in Jerusalem. They didn't live in Jerusalem. They lived uh, uh, just uh, outside a ways, but that was where his work was. And, um, and he served as uh, on the core of priest. And they would be have temple duty every uh I don't know what it was, a couple of weeks or whatever. And uh, and so this was, chapter 1 deals with a uh, count of one of his times of service. And uh, it tells that he had been chosen uh, by lot, uh, uh, which apparently was the custom there that they would uh, select from the priest's own duty for that week, someone. Uh, each day to go into the the uh, holy place and burn incense, and he had been selected for that uh, when this incident occurred. Uh, and when he went inside, it says in verse eleven that uh, well back up to verse ten, and when the time was come uh, for the burning of incense, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. They would have been in the in the uh, temple area that were uh, where the men, the Jewish men were allowed to come and and then beyond that maybe in outer courts where Gentiles and Jewish women would have been allowed. So prayer was going on but he was praying and he was uh, offering incense in the holy place, that sanctuary that separated the uh, outer court there and the uh, holy of holies 
where only the high priest could go uh, once a year. Then it says, verse 11, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, and uh, standing at the right side of the altar of incense, when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. Verse 14, 13 picks up with our focal passage. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. You and your wife, your wife Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. There will be joy and delight for you, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and will never drink wine or beer. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. Now, <clears throat> I didn't read uh, earlier verses which said that, uh, that uh, verse 7, they had no children, Elizabeth and Zechariah had no children, and they were both well along in years. Uh, so this would have been a matter of, uh, of sadness for them because the blessing of children, um, I guess, has always been regarded uh, uh, generally as a, as a time of great joy and a privilege. Uh, and when people cannot bear children, most of them uh, are, regret that uh, fact. And uh, so that was the case here, but they were past the age for having children. So, uh, but they still apparently had prayed about having children many, many, for many, many years, undoubtedly. And so the announcement that the angel, who we'll later find was the angel Gabriel, was um, was one of of. Uh, great encouragement to this couple that were going to be blessed with a, a son. And not only a son, but a special, uh, a special son from God who was going to be used for a great purpose and would influence many uh, for God. So, uh, but he was, uh, it's it says how uh, Zechariah was startled at first. He, you know, he was in the temple serving as a priest, and, and uh, yet God appears to him. Uh, you might think, well, he, he he shouldn't have been startled. Well, I I think that was a natural thing for for him, and it was a natural thing for us. We come to church, even the ministers they come ministering regularly. Uh, on Sundays and Wednesdays and so forth, different days of the week. But when, when a special appearance of an angel occurs, it's big news. It's big news. Does that still happen today? I, I probably does at times. And uh, <clears throat> I can't say that an angel has ever appeared to me in, in where it was clearly uh, an angel of God. He talks in the book of Hebrews about being careful that uh, to uh, when we meet anyone, strangers even, that it could be an angel from God that we're unaware of. And so we need to always be open to the possibility of an encounter with a messenger of God. That's what an angel uh, an angel is, they were, have always have been, they've been special messengers of God to use to bring a message to us. And, and this angel Gabriel was bringing this message to Zechariah that God had, was going to look with favor upon him and Elizabeth and would bless them with a son uh, because he'd heard their prayers. God, uh, Unless we're out of fellowship because of disobedience and unfaithfulness to God, as spoke of, and we mentioned that last week in in Isaiah, I think, chapter 59, if we're uh, disobedient, out of fellowship with him, and our sins uh, get to the point that he will not, 
hear us. He refuses, but but ordinarily uh, he hears us and he knows our concerns. And he says this son, uh, Zechariah, is going to be a delight and a joy to you. And not only that, not only to you, but many are going to rejoice at his birth. Uh, there's no, uh, I'm not sure there's any greater heritage or blessing than the blessing of Christian children, godly children. Oh my. My wife, Diane, and I are so blessed with a godly son and a godly daughter uh, who are faithful, faithfully serving Christ in various ways. Our daughter in, has been in missions uh, through the ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ uh, for over 20 years in Russia. And uh, so it's just a blessing. And children uh, are often that. Uh, sometimes uh, they, as we talked about last week, sometimes they, they have a great deal of problems. And, uh, and sometimes, often, that's not uh, caused by their parents, but it just can, it can happen and does happen. But this son that the, the angel Gabriel instructed them to name John would be a blessing and would bless many people. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He was to not drink alcoholic beverages and, and uh, sort of the Nazarite type uh, designation uh, in, in the biblical time. And it was said that he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. He was going to come into this world filled with the Holy Spirit. And that is a uh, tremendous blessing uh, about that announcement. Verse 16 says, He, referring to John, the child that uh, Elizabeth bear. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord, their God. Uh, so, uh, and we know that uh, that John the Baptist's ministry would be a ministry of warning. It would be telling the people to turn, turn from their ways, to to repent, repent, uh, literally. Uh, as I understand it in the Greek, means to change your mind and in such a way that it changes everything about you, including your behavior, your attitudes, your heart, your desires. And, and that's the change that only God can, can bring about in us. And, uh, but he was going to use and did use John the Baptist as a mechanism, as a instrument for calling people to repentance, to turn uh, from their worldly, selfish, self-sufficient, independent ways to, to a pathway and a mindset and a lifestyle of following and obeying God. Then it says, verse 17, and he, referring to John, will go before him. That's interesting. The pronouns here, it's always important to identify the pronouns to whom they're and, and to whom they're referring. I believe this second hymn, this hymn here, go before him in the spirit, is a reference to the Messiah, Jesus, who, who would be uh, coming shortly after John. Uh, he would go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah, the great prophet Elijah uh, in the Old Testament, uh, who turned many people to God. And uh, it says, he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and uh, the hearts of the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. Clearly, the Lord here is a reference to Jesus, uh, the Messiah, who's being foretold here. Turn, uh, turn the hearts of fathers. That is a reference back to a verse in Malachi. Uh, let me read it. In Malachi chapter 
4. This is the last book of the Old Testament. And there, God uh, led the prophet Malachi to say uh, that, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful great and dreadful day the Lord comes. That would be the second coming of Christ. He, that is the prophet, will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Uh, so it's a reference there. It's difficult to understand fully what that means, except it is a, it's preparatory to, to the coming of Christ for the first time, which would come during John's lifetime uh, at John the Baptist, but uh, even preparatory toward the second coming of Christ, which, which we have yet to experience. Uh, now, let's read on. Meanwhile, verse 21, Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, amazed that he stayed so long in the sanctuary. He'd been in there um, in the holy place for longer than usual. And, and, of course, it was because of his encounter with the angel Gabriel. Uh, it says, and, and they, they were awaiting him to come back out where they could see him and know, know that he had had uh, had uh, um, burned the incense there inside. And uh, it says, verse 22, when he did come out, he could not speak. Okay, I've left out some verses. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I, I left out verses 18 to 20, which are very important. This is during the encounter with with uh, Zechariah, with the angel Gabriel. After he announces this thing about the son that would be born to Elizabeth and, and the greatness of this, of this person in the work of God. Uh, verse 18, Zechariah said, How can I know this? In other words, he doubted. He doubted. He, he, he just couldn't accept it, couldn't believe it. And he, he, he said, I, I, I just can't believe that. Uh, I don't understand it. We're past childbearing age. He didn't say that, but undoubtedly thought it. Uh, he said, and well, he does say that. He says, for I am an old man. My wife is well along in years. And uh, that's what he means. And then it says, verse 19, the angel answered him, I am Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. Hey, uh, Gabriel is only one of two angels that are identified in Scripture by name, the other one being the angel Michael, archangel. But uh, he says, I, I was sent by God to give you this message. That's what an angel does. Verse, but, uh, but Zechariah had 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 doubted he had, he'd been reluctant to believe verse 20 now listen Gabriel tells Zechariah you will become silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their proper time uh, that's uh, greatly important uh, God may not appear to us in visual, tangible form, uh, or uh, an angel from God may not have ever appeared to us, uh, uh, but God speaks to us in various ways. He speaks uh, through His Word, Scripture, the Bible. He speaks to us through prayer as we pray. The, the prayer is supposed to be communication with God, which is a two-way uh dialogue situation and we should uh, concentrate as much on listening for God to speak to us as as we do on voicing or presenting our prayers to God and he will speak that way he also pre speaks to us through other believers to Christians through godly people he also speaks to us through circumstances and so, uh, uh, but we don't always believe. Sometimes we're reluctant to accept the message that God is trying to give us. 
particularly if it stretches our normal course of thinking. And God is normally going to do that. Uh, why would he want to reveal to us things that we expect normally to happen? Uh, you would think that if he wants to speak to us, he'll give us uh, a, a message that may be extraordinary. And that's not to say that he doesn't speak to us in the everyday things of life, but it would not be, we should not think it unusual. We should not uh, be reluctant to believe when God presents us with an unusual message about his plans, his purposes, as he did to to the angel Gabriel, to Zechariah here. But Zechariah doubted, was reluctant, and because of that, uh, he was going to, he asked for this. He said, he said, how can I know? He was asking for some kind of sign, Zechariah was. He said, I, I need something to help me believe that. Well, uh, God says, okay, I'll give you something. I'll give you silence for about nine months uh, during Elizabeth's pregnancy. You won't be able to speak. And, and, and that way you, Maybe you'll be convinced, uh, and but you, when the time is fulfilled, then you will believe it has happened. And so that's what he said to. Uh, we should be, uh, we should want to believe the things of God, even when they stretch us out of our comfort zone. Zone, as in, undoubtedly this message to Zechariah did. Uh, I, I, I confess and admit that that sometimes I, I've sensed that God was trying to tell me something and maybe I uh, maybe those ways that he wanted to utilize me or wanted me to step out in faith in some way and sometimes I've been reluctant and um, and I, I think about a time in my my uh, past oh, 25 years or so when I went through this, time of silence, uh, virtual silence, I lost my voice. I couldn't do more than whisper for uh, several weeks and even months. I uh, don't know that uh, 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 everything that God was trying to tell me through that, but I think he was using that uh, to, to get me to a point where I needed to be willing uh, to, to not rely on anything I could do for him to uh, try to use me, but I would be willing to uh, depend entirely on him. And it went through a, a thing of vocal cord issues and and medical specialists and uh, really uh, the fact that God restored me to be able to speak today and teach uh, verbally. Uh, this is a privilege, wonderful privilege. And uh, so it's a blessing of God uh, to, to be able to do that. Now, I'm, I'm jumping back to where I had uh, gotten ahead of myself. The people were amazed uh, when, when Zechariah finally came out, the people that were outside in, in the temple, but they knew he was speechless and they knew something had happened extraordinary with him. And it says when, verse 23, when the days of his ministry were completed, that was ministering in the temple for that week or two weeks or whatever it was, he went back home. He went back home. And uh, so you can imagine uh, him trying to communicate this. He can't speak. He couldn't speak at all. Uh, when I lost uh, my voice, I could whisper at least. I don't know. Presumably, he must have written out in some form or fashion, uh, maybe uh, sign language to some extent too, but probably wrote out uh, his experience for Elizabeth and maybe for others of uh, of his friends and close close uh, relatives. Uh, verse twenty four and twenty five. After these days, his wife Elizabeth, his Zechariah's wife, had conceived and kept herself in seclusion for five months. She said, the Lord has done this for me. He has looked with favor in these days, past the child, normal childbearing time, um, to take away my disgrace among the people. It, it, was, it was thought to be a blessing of God 
uh, to bear children, and when you couldn't, sometimes it was interpreted as a curse from God or the punishment of God, and it was sometimes regarded among some as a disgrace among among others. So this was a tremendously big thing back then, even as it uh, can be uh, a great sadness today. Uh, but Elizabeth, uh, after uh, Zechariah told her in some form or fashion uh, what had happened, and, and then she did conceive, she realized, and God did, he did accomplish what he said he would back over in, uh, in verse 20, 20. He had said, uh, the angel Gabriel had said, the, the promise that I've revealed to you, Zechariah, will be fulfilled. And God's promises will be fulfilled. Notice it says not only that they'll be fulfilled, but they'll be fulfilled in their proper time. Their proper time. God's proper time. Not our time. Not our time. Not on our wishes. Not when we want it. Uh, uh, we sometimes get so presumptuous that we, when we pray, we pray sometimes with an attitude that, well, God, you're just obligated to answer this prayer and to do it right now. Uh, that's what we tend to be an impatient people. And God says, I will answer uh, your prayers in accordance with my will and, and I will accomplish my purposes, not your wishes and whims and so forth, although it's fine to pray. James says, uh, we ask and we don't receive, the book of James uh, says uh, in the New Testament that you ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss. You ask with the wrong motives to to get your own way, to, to satisfy your own personal uh, desires. Well, we should be praying, seeking to pray in the will of God in accordance with the purpose of God that uh, he will meet our needs and that he'll carry out his plans in his will, in his way, in his time. And that's what he was going to do with the uh, uh, man John the Baptist, uh, the contemporary of Jesus, who would actually uh, baptize at Jesus' request, would baptize him. Jesus didn't need baptizing in the sense of, uh, uh, that he wanted to present a, a testimony of his salvation. He came into this world as the Son of God. And so he was never separated from God by his sins because he never sinned. But uh, but that was the, the place of John the Baptist. So we have this introductory lesson today, and I hope it's been a blessing to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the reminder from these familiar scriptures about the miraculous uh, birth. It wasn't a virgin birth, but it was a planned birth that you used through these normal human means of conception and reproduction of John the Baptist. But you had your hand on him even before he was born, and you foretold his parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, that he was going to be used in a special way. Help us to not doubt your ability and your desire and your plans to use each of us in some way that we might be a part of your gospel plan to present the message of Christ to the world. And may we do that faithfully, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.